Just a quick little introduction to my dear friend, Mara. Um, I met Mara, I don't know how many years ago now. Um, she came and did a presentation at the store when we were able to have presentations in the store, <laughs> the good old days. And uh, she had written a book called Sex in the Sea. And uh, so she came and did a presentation on that and it was amazing. Yeah. Kelly's got the book there. Um, and uh, she did a great job, really got to know each other and became friends. And um, I guess it was, was it last year we did St. Lucia? Just, uh, yeah, just yeah. last uh, August, I think, Yeah, right? so last year in August, we went to St. Lucia and Mara uh, was, our, um, was our guest, basically, to witness the coral spawning in uh, St. Lucia, which was unbelievable. Amazing. One of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. Um, and Mara did some great talks every day, um, you know, making sure that everybody that was there with us, and we had, I think we had close to 50 people on that trip. Yeah. Um, that were, uh, to make sure we all knew what was going on and, and shared a lot of other great insight that she has about the marine environment. Um, she also, uh, you might have heard us chatting earlier, is... Uh, her, I guess, real job is working <laughs> for Future of Fish, um, which uh, I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that. But uh, anyway, we're lucky to have her with us all the way from the Big Island of Hawaii um, to talk a little bit about the kinky stuff that goes on underwater. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mara. Thank you for being here, everyone. And thank you, Mara, for being here as well. Thank you all too. Thank you for that introduction, Steve. Yeah, I think it was like, I think it was just over three and a half years ago now, because it was right after, um, I think it was like 2017 when I, when I first came to the shop. So it's been a, a fantastic and continually evolving relationship. And I'm so happy to be able to be here with you all remotely. Um, I, as Steve said, I, you know, my passion is um, science communication and ocean conservation. And so um, today I'm going to focus on the, the fun, wild and wonderful uh, ways that ocean life reproduces um, and why that matters. So we'll get into that. But I also work um, as the director of discovery at a small nonprofit called Future of Fish. And so um, a lot of my time is also spent trying to figure out how we can help support small scale fishers to earn uh, a viable living, feed their communities while leaving enough fish for the future. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's fun to be able to have kind of both the conservation and the communication sides of things. But as uh, Kelly said, please do um, ask questions. I'm, I'm going to try to leave a, a good chunk of time at the end so that we can dive into this stuff. And, um, and if anything isn't clear, Kelly, please, if someone's asking a question specifically about something I'm talking about, feel free to, to jump in. Uh, we can make this informal. If I was in the room with you all, I absolutely would be wanting, wanting hands or, or conversation. So awesome. Zoom, I love yeah, Zoom always makes it feel a little more restricted. And I can't see, um, you know, Zoom only lets a grid of 20 or so. So I can't see all of the, the folks and faces. But um, for those of you who I've met before, hi again. And um, for those who are new, it's, it's lovely to meet you. Thanks for joining in. I will share my screen now. And I'm gonna need to switch here to view show. Tell me, does this look good? Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Okay. Oh, except, hold on. There we go. All right. So here we go. Um, right now, so I don't know where everybody is located, but I always like to begin with this phrase that if you could close your eyes right now and picture the ocean, many of us picture something that looks something kind of like this, the surface, right? This is what we see. Now, for those of you guys who are big divers, you might picture your favorite dive site, dive um, a reef, a kelp forest, but I always like to think at this time, no matter when it is in the world, whatever time zone you're in, at this very moment, millions and millions of fish and other marine life are having sex right now. And the way that they're doing that, 
strategies that they're using to reproduce look absolutely nothing like what we see on land. And I'm going to give a quick example. So folks who dive on Caribbean coral reefs may be familiar with this fish. This is a parrotfish and this is a female. And in this species and all parrotfish species, they're all born females. Every single individual starts life as a female and then later in life, as she grows and develops, at some point, she can determine if she wishes to change to male. And she'll look like this. And it's not just this external change of wardrobe that we see in these two pictures. It's a full transition. So her body can reabsorb her ovaries and grow testes in their place. Within only a few weeks, she can go from making eggs to producing sperm. It's all triggered through a really delicate change of hormones that have um, relationship to the social structure of the fish. So we often think of these animals as being, you know, uh, maybe not as sophisticated as uh, some of us mammals, but they actually have really strong social cues and behavior patterns that can trigger a transformation as dramatic as this. It's really quite impressive. And they're not the only ones. Sex change in the sea is a really common strategy. So for those of you who enjoy eating seafood, some of the most common species that wind up on our plate are sex changers. So shrimp, as you can see here, similar to parrotfish, they all, oh, sorry, actually not similar to parrotfish, they go the other direction. They start as males, turn into females. Oysters, they can go both ways. They start as male, turn to females, but then they can flip back to being a male. A lot of these changes depend on what the environmental conditions are and whether or not the, um, the reef or the group of the population, the local population needs more males or females in it. So sex change is very, very flexible. And it even shows up in some of the species we know very well. So many of you may have already heard this story, but it is one of my favorites because with Disney's Finding Nemo, we are sort of given a uh, one version of the tale. And so I'm wondering if, if, if I can see some head, little head nods for those of you who have their, their videos on. In these species of clownfish, similar to shrimp, they're all born male. And the largest in the group will transition to female. The reason for this is because they are a very small reef fish, right? And they like to um, partner up and raise, um, sort of raise their eggs. They tend to their eggs. And so it's really important for the male to make sure that his female is going to stick around and for the female to make sure the male is going to stick around. And so to do this, what they do is they have a group that live in an anemone and they're all kind of stuck there because they, they venture too far, they'll get eaten up, right? Just like Disney shows. But in that anemone, all of the smaller fish besides the one large one will be males. But the male who's under the female, the, the largest alpha male, he actually sort of bullies all of the other juvenile males into such a state that they don't mature. So he keeps them sort of prepubescent, if you will. And then the female bullies the big male to make sure that he doesn't transition into a female to compete with her. So there's this bullying hierarchy that happens with these very cute and innocent looking clownfish that kind of keeps this social structure and allows the two largest individuals to be the ones who reproduce. And I'll explain why having the female as the big one makes sense in this group. It all has to do with egg production. So the females in fish, unlike in mammals, the bigger a female fish is, the more eggs she can produce. So as a female in the mammal world, we're born with all the eggs we ever will have and that number actually goes down over time. The opposite is true for fish and shrimp and some other species. So when you're pairing up, if you're going to be stuck with just one, one other individual to reproduce, it makes sense for that clownfish pair for the female to be the biggest because she can make way more eggs and a small male, because sperm is cheap, can fertilize all those eggs. So that's why we see this system happening in clownfish. 
which means that in the real world, when Nemo's mother got you know, killed off by the Barracuda, Nemo's father, Marlin, would have transitioned into Marlene, and Nemo would have matured to then go on and mate with his father turned mother. So it's a little bit more um, Oedipus than Disney in the real world, which is probably why they took, <laughs> I always say, took a little creative license with the plot line. Things would have gone very, very differently. So sex change is really common and it can go in both directions and it's strategic. It helps to increase the number of offspring that are, reprodu that are produced by a population. In parrotfish that we were looking at to begin with, the transition goes from female to male. That works for them because they live more in a harem type society. A large male has to defend a territory and his females. And so it doesn't, it, you can't reproduce until you make that big size as a male. But as a smaller fish, a smaller size fish, you can join in with a male, a large male, and be reproducing as a female until you grow big enough to either challenge that male and take over the harem or swim off and, and form your own. So it, a lot of what we can understand about how the mating strategies of a species work can, can be understood by the type of sex change that they have. Of course, sex change is only one strategy. We also, and, and it's known actually, um, the fancy science word for sex, those types of sex changers are sequential hermaphrodites, right? They're sequential because it comes one after another and they're hermaphrodites because they carry both sex organs at some point in their lifetime. We also have simultaneous hermaphrodites. And these are some beautiful nudibranchs caught in the act where you can see the two are joined together and they are mutually sharing sperm right now. So they are, each of the other are penetrating one another and depositing sperm for fertilization. So this is a form of simultaneous hermaphroditism. And these simultaneous hermaphrodites um, are exhibiting here a really nice display of a fair system where they each are sharing the load. This is not always what happens. <laughs> in many um, nudibranchs, we see some really interesting behaviors start to evolve. And the reason for this is because while being a hermaphrodite means that no matter which individual you meet with, you can mate with them, so that's very advantageous, it's also very expensive to carry both sets of sex organs, to have both male and female genitalia and reproductive systems. And it's even more expensive when you are on the female side of things. And so we, I'm going to walk you through a few examples that start to show some of the behaviors that have evolved for animals who are simultaneous hermaphrodites, but doing all they can not to have to play the female role because it takes more energy to carry the eggs and brood eggs than it does to simply deposit sperm. So in this species here, this is um, uh, Chordata reticulata. And I actually couldn't, I don't know the common name. So Steve, I don't know if this is a nudibranch. You've seen it's in the uh, Indo-South Pacific. And <laughs> this one is really interesting. They get together um, as a mutual pair and they will sort of line up and they sort of feel each other's sides and then they'll turn and orient in sort of a um, back to front position. So kind of like a, 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 a 69, if you will, so that their genital organs will line up and then they will simultaneously penetrate one another. But then as they pull apart, they have this um, really interesting phenomenon where the two sexual organs will stretch and stretch and stretch like a rubber band until they finally kind of pull free. And so they each, after sex, each of the individuals basically looks like it has this um, stretched out slinky <laughs> dragging along behind it. And it's because the head of the penis for these species is full of barbs and snares. And while it is penetrating its partner, it's also grabbing any sperm that has been left there by a rival male or the male side of a rival that, is, that has previously mated. And so the, the, sperm, the head of the penis actually gets stuck 
And that pulling, that stretching helps pull all the sperm out so that only the new sperm that's been left by the most recent mating individual is left behind. What's fascinating is now they have this, you know, overstretched um, phallus that's dragging along. They can actually just drop it. They can um, detach the old penis and they have another one that unfurls immediately after. And they actually have a store of about three of them. So they can mate quickly and sequentially up to three times within about two to three days before they actually have to take a break and regenerate the whole structure once again. So they have the only known um, detachable, regrowable or disposable, regrowable penis in the animal kingdom, which is pretty fascinating when you, when you think about the commitment that, <laughs> that takes in terms of energy and regrowing these systems. So I like to think of these guys as penis Pez dispensers, for those of you who remember the old, the old candy, because they're just flip it out, drops off, flip it out, drops off, one after another. Then we get to an even more extreme example of sequential hermaphrodites. These are flatworms, and I don't know, um, they're from Australia, but they are known as the penis fencing flatworms. And so in this uh, species, the animals, rather than lining up, and mutually depositing sperm, they actually rear up kind of like two snakes, like king cobras going in for a battle. And they have these very sharp and barbed uh, phalluses that come out and they will actually duel. They will battle like two, two little pancakes <laughs> flanking around. And those battles can last up to 45 minutes, which is a really long time. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to mutual, they're each trying to stab the other somewhere on the belly region, the underside, with the penis to deposit sperm. They have to land that um, contact into a pretty restricted region of the body in order for the sperm to make it and fertilize eggs. Meanwhile, they're trying to not get stabbed by their partner. <laughs> so it really is this sort of duel that they have to go through. And the winner is the one who manages to land and inseminate the other without being inseminated themselves. And so in this is, again, an example where they're trying to avoid having to carry fertilized eggs because that is a, a big energy demand on the individual. Meanwhile, they're willing to um, engage in what is actually a pretty harmful type of mating system. Um, these penetrations are um, pretty violent and they can cause, they're like wounds, they can cause infection. So it's a big risk and it's another um, piece of evidence that we have to show just how strong and necessary the desire to mate, to reproduce is in, in the marine world and in all the animal kingdom. It is a fundamental force of life, so much so that these animals are willing to go head to head, penis to penis, to fight it out. So those are just a few examples of what um, sex change and hermaphrodism can look like in the sea. And this, these examples, although they are, I think, pretty colorful, this is just one type of mating strategy that we see in the ocean. There are so, so, so many. And so I'm going to, to share some more of those with you. But I want to make a point before I go into this as to why. Why does it matter that I'm, we're going to spend the next you know, half hour or so more talking about these weird and wonderful strategies? They're entertaining, but they're also really important. So today, we know that over 3 billion people rely on seafood as their primary source of income. It's a lot of folks. We also know that over 100 million people depend on healthy fisheries and abundance of fisheries for their livelihoods. We know that the diversity of life, which is supported through sexual reproduction, the ability to make new combinations and have all these species in the ocean, all of that diversity is a treasure trove of medicinals and new types of, of um, compounds that we can use to fight things like cancer, and heart disease and uh, neurological disorders again and again and again. In fact, I believe um, that the 
original, some of the bacterium that have been used to help create some of the tests for coronavirus um, are in part derived from uh, bacteria that were found on some deep sea thermal vents. So we really, really need and use and benefit from all this diversity and all this abundance in the ocean. We need these um, coral reefs and oyster reefs and other bar natural barriers that form in the, in the sea to protect our shorelines as well, especially as climate change progresses with rising seas and storms. So all of this abundance, all of this diversity, all comes from sex. It all comes from the healthy and vibrant reproduction of marine life. And that is something that we all really depend upon. But until, you know, about, I would say, 50 years ago, at least, and certainly over the last 25 years, we really didn't know a lot about how marine life reproduces. It's hard to study. It often happens very quickly. And often it's only occurring at a certain time of year, or even in a certain few hours of a, one day a year. So it's been really hard for us to know what's going on. But now we're on this wonderful cusp where new science and technology is giving us greater access to understand and study these amazing behaviors. And uh, it's helping us to understand not only what's happening, but be able to plan better. So those sex changing fish, we now are starting by documenting which species are changing sex. We now can set better rules and regulations for how to manage them. So you can imagine that in, in general, for fisheries in the world, there are often catch limits set by size. Sorry, there's catch limits and then there's size limits. And these size limits often set a minimum size so that fishers can't catch baby fish, right? We want them to grow up so that they're big enough to reproduce. But for species that are sex changers, we also need to start thinking about some other regulations because currently, if you just catch the biggest fish, which tends to be what fishers like to target, and you are dealing with a sex changing population, you're catching all the males or all the females, right? And so you might be leaving enough fish adhering to a catch limit, but you've now taken out all of one sex. And while they can change sex, they can't change sex fast enough to catch up with that kind of a shift. And so the sex ratio gets skewed, which means the remaining males or the remaining females, depending on the species, they're left without the ability to find a mate and to reproduce effectively. So for some of these sex changing species, we're starting to implement maximum size limits as well as minimum ones. So in most cases, we actually have the tools and, and the ability to set regulations and management that can work in harmony with these sex changing strategies or whatever reproductive strategies there are in the ocean, but it requires that we know what those strategies look like. And for many species, even ones familiar to us, we're still learning. So this is a salmon. Um, I believe this one is a sockeye. And there are, I, I don't know how many of you, I know I learned about this in like sixth grade where you learn that, okay, the salmon are born, they go down a stream, they're born in fresh water, go down the stream, they live in the ocean for a while, and then they come back to spawn. But there's a whole lot more that's happening in that already complex system. So salmon really are amazing because they're born in a freshwater environment and can undergo all of these physical transitions in order to be able to live in salt water, which is not easy to do. Then as they're in that ocean environment, they're growing big and, and strong. And I like to think of this as sort of, you know, here you have this adult who's at the peak of their, 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 um, their sort of strength and, and health, right? And they're surrounded by all these other attractive, non-mated adults, but they can't spawn. It's like, you're, you're, it's like as if you were living in a big city in your 20s surrounded by all these other attractive singles, but you weren't allowed to spawn until you get old enough to basically be a couple of weeks out from kicking the bucket. And then you have to travel back home to your hometown and your option is to spawn with only people from your high school. 
That's basically what salmon have to do. They spend their whole lives out in the ocean getting big and strong, and then they all come back with that same cohort, that same year class, back up the stream with the same individuals to reproduce. It takes enormous uh, strength and, and uh, stamina to be able to make it back up to those spawning grounds. It also takes a remarkable sense of smell because they use that sense of smell and the chemistry of the seawater to be able to detect exactly which stream and tiny little, um, even little uh, sort of tributary of the stream to go to. The reason why they're so careful is that the idea or the sort of, you can imagine that the, um, the strategy is that the rivers where they were born and were able to successfully rear as, as young and then go down into the ocean, those should be good places for their young to be born and to come back down to the ocean. So that's why they, they, they do this incredible kind of circular migration. When they get up to the stream beds, if they can get up there, then the males and the females, the females kind of create these little nests called reds. And then the big males will shimmy over. And if the female's receptive, they'll do this little sort of little dance over this indented um, pebble pool, pebble nest. And the male and female will synchronize their release of sperm and eggs. And because it's sort of in this nest pebble structure, it helps keep the sperm and eggs together so it doesn't all disperse and that increases the, the um, likelihood of fertilization and the rate of fertilization. And then they die. That's it. It's a pretty, pretty um, so much energy for them to get up there. That's all they have left. But over the past, I would say, I can't remember now exactly when these studies were done, but folks started to notice, especially with genetics, that it looked like there was more happening with salmon than we realized. And it turns out that some males in the population choose not to go out to the ocean. They sort of lay in wait in the streams and they never get very big. They stay really small. They're called jacks. And these jacks are basically sneak attack males. And what they do is as the large couple are, are starting, um, when they do get up to spawning season and the male and females pair up and they start to do their little shimmy, these jacks will dive in right when those two are spawning to drop their own sperm. And they actually have a faster than average um, ejaculation than the, the large males. So that the jacks are able to really kind of like dive bomb the, the couple and then get out of there before the big males can, can charge at them. So at first we thought, well, wow, that's, a, that's an interesting alternative strategy. Um, this is it's seen, sneaker males are seen in other species, but we didn't realize it was happening in salmon and one of the things we've discovered is that it's actually a really important mechanism for them because it creates more genetic diversity because these males may not be born in the same year that the adults are that are coming back and they don't die afterwards necessarily right away. Some of them may be able to spawn for multiple seasons. That creates a cross bridge of genetics from different years of salmon that are being born in that stream which is really important, again, for increasing the genetic diversity of the population. So not only is it an effective strategy and an alternative effective strategy for sex, but it turns out that it's an important one for the health of that population. For those of you who are divers on the Caribbean, Steve, this is one of my favorite parts of St. Lucia because we got to see these guys every day, all year, right at high noon these big bluehead wrasse males will start to, to swim and try to convince a whole bunch of other females to swim up with them and do these wonderful little spawning arcs. So the male swims up, the female joins, and they poof at the top. And they will, they will do this sequentially with multiple females. I think their record ever counted was like 150 spawns in one, one day, 150 females that went with this one male. But... Again, these blue-headed wrasse, not all of them um, go by this standard approach. So to be a blue-headed wrasse, first an individual starts as a female and then it transitions to become this alpha male. That's the, the main pathway. But some of the blue-headed wrasse, oh, I thought I had a picture of the other guy. 
do lobsters make? Well, some of the blue-headed wrasse look just like the female shown here below. And they are called um, sneaker males, just like in the, the salmon. And these guys are yellow. They look just like the female. And so they wait in the wings. And I wrote down, because I, I wanted to make sure I got the numbers right on this, because it really is quite impressive. These sneaker males are able to produce, so a big male wrasse will be able to produce about three to four million sperm at a time in an ejaculation. These sneaker males can pump out 50 million sperm at once. So it's more than 10 times what these alpha males can do. So they basically swamp this, the, um, the sperm of the big male by coming in and again, dive bombing. They invest over 20% of their body weight to their testes, these small males. So I'm gonna let you all do your own math, but thinking of, of males you know and how much they weigh, imagine 20% in their testes. It's huge. So they put all their investment into growing very, very large testicles and huge volumes of sperm rather than growing big. Because of that, they can't defend the territory and attract females like these big blue heads can. So instead they wait in the wings and do this dive bomb. And I think we were able to see some of that um, in St. Lucia, I know I did. Steve, do you remember seeing some of those guys kind of coming in from the side? Absolutely, and I have to jump in here for a second. I've, those of you that know me know that I've been lucky enough to do a fair amount of dives in my lifetime. And I've seen these fish multiple, multiple times. But until diving with Mara in St. Lucia, I had no idea <laughs> that this thing happened every single day at noon and from that point on, every dive we did and that we were out there at noon, I would stop and specifically look for this activity. And sure enough, I mean, every single dive we did at noon, we'd see this behavior. Yeah. Unbelievable. And I, I can't thank you enough for turning me on to that because it was something I never knew existed. <laughs> and, and I've I'll never forget your, like, your... Um... You're cheering underwater. There was, I could just hear you going, oh, because they were, it is, it's really clear when you see it. And it's wonderful because it's this, these arcing. And some of them, there's a third strategy that they use too, which is the group spawn. So in some cases, all of these sort of sneaker males, there will actually be so many of them that they can overpower a blue headed, one of the blue heads, one of the, the alpha males, and they will take over sort of an area and they tend to look for like the top of a coral head. So they're sort of up in the water column. And then you'll see just yellow because it's all of the yellow females and these little yellow males. And they'll be doing like this giant group spawn. Um, also right, right at noon. It's, it's, we call it noontime, noontime nookie, but it's, it's really fun to see. And so for those of you who snorkel or dive, and you're in the Caribbean, these are one of the most common fish. And often you won't see the blue heads. Like if you're doing a morning dive, you won't see them. And then again, just around 11, 11, 30, 12, you'll just, they start to show up right at the top of the reef area and uh, top of coral heads. And it's, it's really clear. So I encourage you all to, to check it out um, and to be on the lookout for it. It's really fun. So more sneakers and lots of, of regular spawning in, a, in another sex changer. I had to include lobsters because I think of all the research and all of the amazing things, this story of, of lobsters still just leaves me humble because they are such a common um, seafood item. We don't tend to think of them as very complex and they have one of the most um, kinky and romantic rituals that, that we know of um, in the ocean and have been able to document. So I'm gonna tell you, tell you a little bit about lobsters. For those of you who've heard it, I hope you'll enjoy it again. But lobsters have this really interesting um, predicament, female lobsters do, in that the best time for them to mate is right after she has molted, when she's lost her hard shell. And this is because she has a little pouch at the base of her tail and she wants a male to be able to fill that whole pouch, fill the, the, the pouch fully so that she doesn't have to mate again for a long time. She can just draw on those stores. When she molts, that pouch actually is part of the shell. And so she has a fresh new pouch that she needs to fill. 
For the males, they want to mate with a freshly molted female because the pouch, again, is empty and they don't have to have their sperm mixing with any other prior males who may have mated with her before they got the chance. So both males and females want to mate right after she's molted. But lobsters during mating season, male lobsters, are incredibly aggressive. They will attack males or females who approach their den. So this female has to engage in close contact with a giant clawed male at his most aggressive time, at her most vulnerable time. It's, it's, a, it's quite a challenge. So what does she do? Well, <laughs> conveniently, lobsters know the secret love potions of the sea. And for these females, she will approach his den and as the male comes out, she will spritz him in the face with her urine. And her urine acts as this incredible love potion. Every day for about three or four days, she will spritz him again and again, and then get out of there before he can attack her. And after those three to four days, the, a chemical tr the, the, the smell of her, the chemistry of her urine actually changes his behavior. And he will welcome her into his den. They will cohabitate there for about a week. They will each go out and hunt and feed and do what they do. And then right before she feels that the molt is coming on, she circles around in front of him so that they're facing one another. And they start to spray each other with their urine again, pee, this pee potion. And the male then bows his head sort of down and braces his, um, himself down uh, with his two claws in the sand. And she comes up and she taps him with her big claws on one shoulder and then the other. And we call this knighting because it really does look like that. And it's a signal to the male that she's going to molt and that he should not leave the den. It's, everything's about to happen really soon. She goes to the back of the den, slips out of her hard shell. All the while, he is basically um, guarding the entrance so that no other animals can come in. And he also then walks back and sort of touches her with his antenna and also his little walking legs. And on the bottom of lobster's feet are where they actually have their taste buds. So he's kind of licking and tasting her. Again, this is, this is kind of the kinky part. Then when she indicates that she's ready, he will roll her over onto the back and he cradles her in those walking arms while bracing himself with his claws and his tail in the sand. And he holds her sort of in this hammock of, of his little walking arms and pulls her into him. And they mate in the missionary position. He has two specialized appendages right at the base of his tail that slot into that pouch and are able to deposit the sperm. The mating happens quite quickly. And then he very gently will lay her back down. Over the next three to four days, while she is completely vulnerable, she's so, she's so weak, she can't, without her hard shell, she can't even support her own body weight to stand, he will guard the front of the den. So he doesn't leave to go out and feed. He stays with her. Her shell hardens. She regains her strength. She's got her full pouch. He's done his job. They say, thank you very much. And off she goes. And then about a day later, the next female will approach and start to spray him in the face with her urine. And the whole system will repeat because Maine lobsters are serial monogamists. They're monogamous for a short period of time with one couple, one couple and then the male moves on to the next partner called serial monogamy. So I just think this is a really cool story of how um, intimate and complex some of these systems can be, even in the animals that we know really, really well. And we only just started to discover this behavior in lobsters in the late 1990s, so you know, about 20 years ago, um, using some very specialized techniques in, in laboratory environments where we were able to actually get sort of um, simulated dens and red lights um, and night camera, night vision to be able to see all this happening. So that's, that's the way lobsters do it and, and the way that we are able to continue to enjoy them as this amazing seafood um, over, over the decades. Uh -huh. Yes. What, what's unique about the way lobsters urinate? Oh, yes, I skipped that part. Um, so... <laughs> It, it would be hard um, for other animals, including us, to use this technique um, because of the way that 
our, our bodies are oriented, but lobsters very conveniently have their bladders sitting on top of their brains. And they actually have two um, sort of valves under their eye stalks that allow them to shoot the pee forward. And so when the female approaches the male, especially in that um, sort of dangerous time of first initiation, when, when um, she's trying, to, trying to, to entrance him, if you will, he can come out and she can just sort of peek her head around the corner and literally fire two jets of her urine forward at him and, and then get, get out of there before he can actually attack and get her. So yeah, they're able to spray their urine forward using these little nozzles and um, kind of fan, fan-like appendages under their eye stalks. Good question. <laughs> so it's not quite the way we, we've caught it in the cartoon with the little old fashioned perfume bottle, but it's very similar in, in the, uh, the effect. So why does this matter? You know, so when we're talking about salmon, we're talking about lobsters. How are we, how are we affecting the, these kinds of systems? Well, with lobsters, we know that the reason the female is able to seduce this male and entrance him is because her urine carries a very potent and specific chemical message and that the male is able to receive that message. All of that depends on the chemistry of the sea. The message has to flow through seawater. And unfortunately, with climate change, we are changing the chemistry of the ocean. And that means two things could be happening. One, it, there is potential that these messages and these signals that animals are using to communicate via chemistry, those signals could get scrambled. They may not work as well in a um, ocean environment where the chemistry is different. We also know that as animals are developing in these more and higher, um, it's higher pH, so more acidic conditions, that their receptors aren't developing in the same way and can be damaged. So it may be that they can't receive the chemical message in the same way. So we could scramble the message or we could be damaging the body parts and organs that help them to receive those messages. So this is one of those subtle but really significant impacts that we may be having on the sex lives of marine life because so many of them depend on chemical signaling for communication and for um, ensuring that the mating uh, process actually happens. With salmon, um, it's a similar, but the other side of climate change. Um, so rather than the chemistry changes we're seeing, it's the warming waters. So again, salmon tend, um, they, they do, they live in the, the Pacific Northwest, at least Pacific salmon, um, all the way up through Alaska. They're a cold water fish. And just this summer, um, we, last summer we were seeing, and into now, we're seeing that um, historic salmon runs, like in Bristol Bay, Alaska, the stream temperatures are reaching unprecedented levels. And the salmon stopped at the base, at the mouth of these rivers and streams. They wouldn't go up them because the water was so warm. And so this, this um, strategy that depends on these large adults being able to move up the rivers all broke down. And part of the reason for that is that warmer water carries less oxygen. And you can imagine for anybody who you know, runs on a treadmill or runs uphill, swimming upstream takes a lot of energy. And for these salmon, they need a lot of oxygen to feed their muscles and be able to get up there. If the water's too warm, they won't go. Um, so these are, again, other kinds of effects that are so different than the way that we mate, the way that we reproduce, that sometimes we're not realizing that we can be having such profound impacts, even if it's indirectly through things like chemistry change and temperature change. Okay. Tara, we had a quick question. Yeah. Uh, Michael asked, how often do male lobsters attack the females before they have a chance to get away? It's a great question. Um, frequently is the answer. Um, so it, it, there have been cases where, or, or often observations of um, outside a dominant alpha male's den, the, the carcasses basically of, of females or males, um, rival males that have been trying to challenge, but also females. So it's known that if she is not able to sort of um, douse him enough time and kind of shift that behavior, that, um, that yeah, she can be killed. Um, it's hard to know, like statistically, I can't tell you like, you know, 10% of all females who approach, mm -hmm. just because again, this is really hard to observe. Often um, 
you know, again, the female tries to be quick. So she's approaching, spritzing, getting out of there. So the chance for us to really observe and count um, how many are approaching and also know how many females, like we're still not sure how females decide which female is going to approach which male, um, why she picks which male and what would happen if two females both wanted to go for a male at the same time. We still don't know what some of those, um, those processes look like or what governs that behavior. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. So um, we've been talking about fish. We talked um, about some neuterbranks, some lobster, but I wanted to share about some of the species that we, you know, are perhaps have a, a sense that we might know better because they're a little bit more like us, such as whales and the other marine mammals, right? So they are mammals. They breathe air. They carry live young. This means they reproduce very similarly to us through internal fertilization. So the males have a penis, the females have a vagina, insertion happens, and fertilization occurs inside the female where she then um, rears a live, um, an embryo that turns into a live birth. Okay, so we'd think that given this, we might understand these systems um, in, in marine mammals a little bit better, but even these animals throw us um, some surprises and some continued mysteries as we start to learn about them. So I don't know how many of you have ever had the experience of going through a true labyrinth, like one of these big mazes um, that you see sort of in Europe. Um, but this is exactly what it must feel like if you were a dolphin sperm, a small whale sperm in species where rather than a straight tunnel, which is the most common form of a mammal vagina, instead you are faced with this gauntlet of obstacles, twists, turns, tunnels, and pathways. So there are some researchers that about, I guess almost six years ago now, started to look at in detail at the anatomy of small female whales and they were shocked to find that rather than the tunnel that we're so used to, just a, a straight path that makes it easy for sperm to get from the entrance to the egg, they were finding all of these structures. So these maze-like whale vaginas were something we had no idea existed until about 2013-14. Now, what's fascinating is that these structures take energy to build, right? And again, when you think about evolution and you think about the way that life um, evolves, extra structures like this tend not to, to stick around unless there's a purpose. So as the researchers over the past two or three years have dug into this a little bit more, what they found is that we see these more complex vagina structures in species where females have less control over who is mating with them and where there are many males who mate in short succession with one female. So in some species of dolphins and whales, there are dominant males, alpha males, that basically monopolize females in a pod and they will mate with those females and the males fight for that position. But in other species, we find that males don't fight and they just actually will help each other in gaining access to females and mate in very rapid succession. So in the first system, if you have a dominant male, an alpha male who's, who's been strong enough, fast enough, you know, whatever enough to win over the other males, that's a form of selection. By default, that male should have some fitness advantage. That means that he's passing that fitness advantage off through his sperm to the future offspring. So for those females, they don't have to worry as much. And again, I'm, I'm making this all in, in very um, loose kind of informal terms. But the females, there's been selection already that's happened because of the males fighting one another. But in the system where the males actually help each other to mate and a female is mated with multiple times in a row, she actually has very little control prior to copulation around who, who she's being mated with and whose sperm is coming in to fertilize her eggs. Because again, females carry that energy burden, it's really a tax on them 
to rear these young, they want to make sure that that sperm is healthy and fit and going to lead to the most healthy offspring. So what we think is, is that in these systems where the females have less control prior to sex, these more complicated structures could act in ways to help screen and filter out sperm after copulation has happened. So you can imagine it could just be an obstacle course where only the most tenacious sperm actually makes it through. We know that these different channels are lined with all sorts of glands that could release chemical secretions that could help or harm sperm depending on, on um, the circumstance. And we also know that there's muscular um, structures that could contract and shunt different pathways for different um, after mating so that certain sperm maybe are, are pushed towards dead ends while others are allowed to progress through, through other channels. So we're still trying to figure this all out, but having these structures, especially given the mating systems that we see them in, indicates that there likely is some level of female choice happening. And we call this cryptic female choice because it happens after sex and it's internal within the female's body rather than a type of sexual selection that's happening kind of out in the battlefield. So this is a fascinating whole new line of research that's really only been around for, I would say, the last you know, five to maybe 10 years where we're realizing that much more control may actually sit with the females than we have previously thought. We see this also um, in sharks where females are able to store sperm sometime for up to years at a time. They have all these structures, um, these little like compartments that they can um, house sperm in. And we're just starting to understand uh, when and how they choose which sperm they actually are using to fertilize their eggs. So again, really fascinating um, new discoveries are happening as we start to have the tools and technology to uh, study the female anatomy even more. And really recently, so just last year, um, a preliminary, so it's not totally final, but a preliminary study that was done on bottlenose dolphins. We know that, so for anybody who's observed dolphins, we know they like to have sex. They have lots and lots of sex. And we know that sex is not um, necessarily for reproduction. There's homosexual sex, male and male sex, um, uh, the young, uh, so uh, sons will mate with their mothers at times when we know the mother is not, not fertile. Um, so we think that this can be practice, it can be for dominance, it can be um, for other types of social communication. But there's always been the question about, is it sex for fun? Is it for, for play, for pleasure? Do any other animals do this? This is a question I get all the time is, you know, does anybody else have sex for fun? And so just last year, the same researchers who, um, this, this um, woman, Dr. Dara Orbach, who had led some of the discoveries with the whale vagina structures, looked at um, through stranding, so where um, bottlenose dolphins had stranded and their bodies had been collected, she was doing dissection specifically on the female clitoris. And she was able to show that the same path of nerves, erectile tissue, blood flow, and other systems were in place that we see in human anatomy. And that the way that the clitoris is structured in these females means that there would be um, uh, pressure and activity no matter the position that the male was in. So it's indicative that, it's in, it indicates that most likely there is some sort of stimulation happening within these females when they do copulate, which is, pretty strong evidence that we that we um, haven't had before that most likely there is some sort of sensational um, sensation that could be related to pleasure happening in these females. So that just came out um, at a conference, I think it was last August, and they're waiting to um, be able to do dissections on a few more individuals. I think they had about 11 or 15 at the time. They're looking to get up to about 20 to 25 before they'll feel like they can definitively say this, but this has been a new discovery and it's, and it's a fascinating one because again, um, we wonder about these kinds of things. We can't ask these animals. So we have to rely on the anatomy in order to, to try to deduce um, what some of the causes are for, for some of these behaviors. And I'm just checking the time. I know I'm getting close. So I'll, I'll go a little bit more quickly, but 
I love, I love that we're, we're gaining this knowledge um, to some of our closest marine cousins. Okay, so we've been staying mostly at the surface in the shallows of, of the ocean for a lot of this talk. And so I wanted to make sure that I did include a little bit about some of the amazing types of sex in the sea that we're just now starting to learn from the deep. So this is a fan fin anglerfish. And it is the first time that we've ever filmed um, a living couple. And this was filmed, I think, in 2015, um, maybe 16, by the Rebikoff Foundation. I believe, I'm just checking, I think it was at about 3,000 feet down. Um, so really, really deep. And this species is fascinating because the males are born without the ability to feed themselves. Okay, so when they're born, they have to find a female fast. They're born without any um, organs, but they are, uh, organs to feed themselves, but they are born with a very strong sense of smell. And so they set off kind of sniffing their way through the black waters trying to find a female. Meanwhile, the females are these much larger fish. They're about 10 times the size of the male. They have these beautiful tendrils that you can see here that actually have sort of um, lights that, that sort of emanate out from them and radiate out. And they sit in the dark waters as um, ambush predators, right? They use that lure to attract fish in and then they, they eat them up. But they also send out a very strong pheromone. So it's like a perfume that goes out into the water to attract these males to them. So the male is sniffing his way through the black waters and when he finds her scent, he hones in and then goes to find her. Rather than being int intimidated by this absolutely gargantuan female, he gets very excited and the closer he gets, the stronger his urge to bite. That is when things get weird. He will approach underneath her and bite onto her belly. The physical contact between the male and female then triggers a whole set of chemical reactions in both their bodies. For the male, his jawbone starts to disintegrate. His flesh kind of fuses into hers. Their two circulatory systems start to combine and all of his internal organs start to dissolve, except for his testes. His testes actually are triggered to grow and start producing sperm. So at the end of the day, he is basically a permanently attached sperm factory for the female. And in this image here, this is a still from the, this live video that was caught about three years ago. It's the first time that we've seen a male attached to a female with both of them living. Now you can imagine in the deep sea, like why, why would we have this really bizarre system? I mean, this is, this is weird, right? This is not the kind of behavior we see on a farm. This is strange, but it also makes sense. It's very, very efficient in an environment where it's hard to find mates and resources such as food are very limited. So here we have the female and male permanently attached and we think that because their circulatory systems are shared, that her hormonal cycle, so when she ovulates, can send messages to him to let him know that that's the time when he should be getting ready to ejaculate so that she can actually coordinate the release of sperm at the time that she's releasing her eggs. So a fascinating system and one that we have um, hypothesized about but have never seen until just a few years ago. It's, it's pretty exciting to me that we now have these technologies and are able to, to start to actually witness and see some of these behaviors. But these technologies that are allowing us to understand and explore the ocean are also um, posing some, some challenges and some new threats that we also need to be thinking about. So about um, three years ago, we discovered um, a uh, new scientist discovered a new species of deep sea octopus that live, I think it's, I'm just checking about two and a half, two and a half miles down on the sea floor. And this octopus is really neat because it's so, so deep that there's not a lot of, it, it's really on the abyssal plains down there. 
and it lays its eggs on these tiny sponges that attach to rocks that are on the, on the sea floor. Small rocks, kind of nodules. Turns out that these rocks have many rare earth minerals, um, especially um, things that we use in our electronics. And right now, there are companies in the world and international policy organizations that are figuring out how we might be able to mine the deep sea for these minerals, including constructing these giant bulldozers that would actually be able to go and um, scrape the sea floor. The problem is those bulldozers would, as they scraped up the rocks, would scrape up all the sponges and all of the eggs that this octopus was laying with it, right? We didn't even know this species existed three years ago. How many more animals like this have specific mating and reproductive strategies that we just don't understand and know? The answer is a lot. So often knowingly and unknowingly, we are making it harder for marine life to reproduce in the ocean. And that has huge consequences for all of us, right? We all know, especially nowadays, it's hard to, to date. It's hard to mate without somebody always coming in and interrupting things, right? When you've got the scene set and the, and the, and the mood, right? So we have to fundamentally rethink the way that we interact with the ocean environment, including not just when we're in the sea, but also our behaviors on land. And so while I hope that these have these stories have been fun and you've learned some interesting facts um, through this talk. I hope you also all will remember when I say that we are all, no matter where we live, far more intimately connected with the oceans than we realize. And we all have a job to do to try to shift the way that we are able to interact with the sea. So I'm going to share with you now some of the ideas. You can see I have a little guest coming in. <laughs> um, share with you all now ways in which I think that we can do this, shifting our relationships so that we can help improve ocean life. Okay. Can you tell me? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Give me a sec. I'm hey, okay. Steve. Okay, go find Daddy. He's in charge. <laughs> I forgot to lock the door. Sorry. Oh, Zoom, it's okay. Zoom calamity. <laughs> all right. So... Okay, how can we help our oceans? Again, from under the sea or um, on, on land. As I said at the beginning, a lot of the work that I do now and a lot of the ways that we all interact with the oceans is through the seafood that we buy. And so I am not going to say stop eating seafood. In fact, the opposite. I think fish is the best protein source out there for us. And if we can source our seafood sustainably, we will be able to feed more people and have healthier oceans. It's a win-win. So how do we start to do this? First, um, we like to say that every fish has a tail. This means that every fish has information about where it was caught, how it was caught, whether it was, it's illegal or not. As a consumer, we need to start asking for this information when we purchase our seafood. We also need to start looking for um, certifications and ranking guides that are out there to help guide our choices and convince our grocery stores and our local restaurants when they reopen um, that we prefer and want to know that we are being served fish species that have been caught responsibly. Some of the ways that we can do some kind of general rules for, for healthy seafood consumption um, in terms of our own health and the oceans are to look low on the food chain. So smaller fish like sardines and mackerel, oysters, mussels, clams, the shellfish, these all reproduce like crazy. And with just basic good management, they can withstand a fair amount of fishing pressure. In the US, we also tend to have fairly robust fisheries policies and regulations. We are seeing more recoveries of US fish than we're seeing declines. So it's actually a good news story and so if you do live in the U.S., try to support locally caught fish species. And local can mean just from the east or west coast or the Gulf Coast, or it can, can mean if you're on those coasts, really honing in right now with, um, with COVID's impacts, especially on restaurants, 
there are a lot, if you live on, in, in coastal areas, there are many what are called CSFs, Community Supported Fisheries. They're similar to CSAs that we get from farms. These are um, direct sale channels that are trying to connect fishers with their local communities to, to directly be able to move responsibly caught products and help support um, fishers during this time. They tend to be with small scale independent fishers as well. So you know that you're supporting likely a member of, of your community or of, of a small scale fishery. So those are some of my recommendations and we can absolutely talk about some more. The other is to really think about all the time, what are we using to clean our homes, wash our own bodies and care for our lawns? All of these chemicals wash out to sea and we know now, as some of the examples with sex changers and um, the seduction patterns of lobsters, chemistry matters. And pollutants can have similar effects to climate change in masking or disrupting the ability of animals to detect the kinds of chemical cues they need to reproduce. So try to look for natural products, biodegradable products, and really think about how you can reduce the flow of, of chemicals from, from your, your home to, to the waterways. We know also this is not all on consumers. Um, industry really has to step up and take a precautionary approach to protect species where we know some of these patterns exist. And then um, where we don't have enough information, like in the deep sea, we really need to proceed with caution. We need to assume that there is some new crazy wild behavior that we may never have even imagined that's happening, that we don't know what the impact will be. And therefore we don't go until we figure it out. Um, that kind of precautionary approach, unfortunately, is not normally the case. And so we've seen declines in species before we've even had a chance to really study them. That needs to change and can change moving forward through stronger policies, which brings me to taking action as citizens in the places we work, in the towns where we live, in the countries where we vote, we must support science and act on climate. We must be pushing policies and practices that understand and value science-based decision-making and that recognize that we are running out of time to shift things when it comes to climate change. We have a huge election coming up in the fall, and I encourage all of you to do your best to educate yourselves, find, about, find out as much as you can about the candidates, and look for those who respect and have a track record of applying science, scientific knowledge, and, and the institutions of science when they're moving forward their own policies. It is so, so critical. But I wanted to end, because policies cannot feel so great, on a fun note, which is the good news that we all know, and we said at the beginning, is that nature is on our side with all of this, right? Animals want to reproduce. They really want to reproduce. This is a story um, that almost didn't make it into my book because the discovery happened in late um, 2015 just as the book was um, supposed to be going, going to press. So again, another one of these just in the last few years. But it, it is absolutely an amazing tale and helps show how much animals strive and, and will put forward to reproduce successfully. This is a um, small tooth sawfish. It's an endangered species, lives in the Gulf, especially around, around Florida, Everglades. And it, um, was overfished uh, in the early part of the 20th century, um, mostly as a trophy fish. You know, the bill was, was um, considered valuable or prestigious and also due to habitat decline. Uh, strong regulations came into play, um, especially in the 2000s. It's been a protected species and the numbers are starting to come back up. So in 2015, a group of researchers were tagging um, some of these uh, fish, they're trying to understand where they go, how, how the population is changing, and they caught this female, and I'm hoping you guys can see this upper right. They caught this huge female, she's on her back, and this is her cloaca, which is like the vaginal opening for a shark. 
And coming out here is this tiny little bill of a small tooth sawfish baby. The female they caught was pregnant and she actually started to give birth on the line. And so the researchers were able to take a fin sample, a little clip of skin from the mother and all the babies that came out, which is really unusual to be able to, to collect from the mother and the pups. Shark babies are called pups. You can see this one down here in the bottom. And so they wanted to tell, they wanted to determine through genetics whether or not all the babies were fathered by the same male or whether the female had been mating with multiple males and these um, babies were half siblings. So they did this work and what they found out when they ran the genetics was that there were no males involved at all. These females were having what's known as virgin birth or parthenogenesis, which is a technique or, or a system whereby a female's egg will split and then recombine with itself to form a viable embryo. It's pretty rare. We know that some lizards can do it, but we didn't know that it happened in the wild. We knew it happened um, for some shark species in Aquaria, and we thought it was under very stressed and unnatural environments, but it turns out that we're seeing this in, in the wild in these sawtooth sawfish, small tooth sawfish. Um, and part of it is because their populations got so low that it is hard for females to find a mate. So this is a response that she can use to reproduce. Now, the thing with parthenogenesis is that it won't save a population long term because there's not enough genetic mixing. We really do need males and females to come together in, in true sex for this to work. But it can boost their numbers. And boosting their numbers is one way that can help a population kind of make it through while we put policies and regulations in place to help reduce the impacts on that population. So this was a pretty exciting and interesting um, development that we, we found. And it gives me hope. It makes me think of the fact that we, if we just shift our behaviors a little bit, these animals in the ocean are resilient and they are and they, and they are driving towards the same result that we want, which is to create the next generation of fish and shrimp and whales and sharks and lobsters. So my hope is that you'll take away from this that there's a lot for us to do, but a lot to also be optimistic about, realistically optimistic about. We know how to help make thriving, abundant oceans. We now just have to put that knowledge to action and continue to explore and support science to study these sexual strategies in the sea so we can continue to add to that knowledge base and have many, many more fish for the future. So I thank you all for listening. Um, I do like to acknowledge the incredible work of all the researchers who I rely on to, to share with, uh, with me their amazing science and their stories. And I would love to take questions. I know we're over time, but I am happy to stick around. Thank you, Mara. We really appreciate it. It was wonderful. Let me go through the chat and I will pull up some questions for you. Give me just a second. Sure. Hey guys, there's a chat function at the bottom of your screen. If you haven't um, Zoomed much before, you can go in there and type your questions. Um, just put your mouse down there and you'll see it pop up as a little chat icon. Um, but Mara, I'm going to unfortunately have to run. So I'm going to turn this over to Kelly, but uh, I wanted to thank you so much. So great to see you. We great need to see to you too, up. Steve. We need to catch up soon. This was All right. I agree. Really gratifying for me to have such little time to chat with you. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's set up a time. We'll do our, a Zoom date. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Take care, Steve. Bye-bye. Bye, Steve. Bye. All righty, Mara. I do have one question. Do Great. the male lobsters also molt? And if so, how are they protected when they are vulnerable? It's a great, it's a great question. They do. So all, all lobsters molt, they molt throughout their um, lifetime. It's how they, they grow. So um, same with, with crabs, any species that has that hard ex exoskeleton, external skeleton needs to molt because the, the shell doesn't grow with them. So they sort of, um, they grow into it until it gets too big and then they slip out, grow the new one. 
So most of the time, the males will have to hide. They will have to move into, and they often, this is part of why they have dens, but they look for um, areas where they can kind of um, be, be invisible to the rest of the world during this two to three days when, when they are soft shelled. Um, and most of them do have a, a den-like or kind of small cave structure that they'll, they'll go to in order to, um, to do that. Great question. Um, another question about the lobsters. Do Caribbean lobsters have a similar mating strategy? Oh, this is the question because I work more with spiny lobsters than main lobsters. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody has studied them to this degree yet. So I, I have a perpetual call out to, to spiny lobster fishers, scientists, recreational divers. If you guys see them mating, or witness any kind of um, what looks like urine pee battles, please, please let us know. In the main lobster, the males, the, the use of urine as a, as a chemical signal goes far beyond just um, the mating um, strategies and, and, and reproductive strategy. So males will spray one another with urine during battles. And we know that the signal is, um, they, they can recognize to the individual level, which is actually pretty, um, pretty impressive. Not a lot of animals that we know um, can recognize specific individuals and remember them. So a male who has lost in battle to another male, if you reintroduce that male a few weeks later, a few months later, that loser male won't engage with the other one. He's like, nope, I remember this guy, not gonna battle, you, you won, I'm, I'm good. So it's, it's really, really interesting and it's a very, very um, important um, communication, way of communication that, that these lobsters use but I don't know if spiny lobsters are the same. I would venture a guess that they probably do use urine to communicate because that is, it seems like such a fundamental um, thing for, for Maine lobsters, but I don't know. I don't know for anything except the, the, um, the Maine lobster. So please help me, help me find out. Definitely, I'll be watching for uh, lobster <laughs> urine these days for sure. Yes. Yes. Um, another question, do angler fish keep the same mate for life or can more males attach throughout the life cycle? Both. More oh. males can attach. They can have multiple males. We have specimens in museums, you know, and, and collections that have been brought up again dead, but we've seen up to three to four uh, dwarf males attached. Um, not all anglerfish species do the males attach permanently and not all do they attach at all? So we know that there are some species where the males are still small dwarfs, but they don't attach. Other species where the attachment seems more temporary. And then this third group where the attachment is permanent, where it's a true parasitic male. Um, and, and so where the, it's in the species where the male does attach permanently, she absolutely can have multiple males that she can accumulate over time. And then does More she, the does she like decide which sperm to take or it's do we know? Great, so again, that's a great question. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't recall, I don't think we know, um, but that's a good one for me to follow up on. Um, but I think again, the, the, the way that she's able to control, you know, who, who would ejaculate and when um, mm -hmm. is still being figured out how much control she has. But what I can say is that large female fish, again, can carry tens of thousands of eggs. Um, and anglerfish, I, I'm not exactly sure um, how, how many she may have, a, a mature in the, the fan fin. But it benefits her to have multiple males um, in their sperm in the sense that it's just more diversity. It's more genetic diversity. It's kind of like um, putting... <laughs> not putting all your eggs in one basket, right? And so if she has multiple males, my guess, and it is a total guess, would be that she, she would use, use all of their sperm for different, for her batches. But if for some reason she felt like, I don't know, one of the males was a dud, I don't, could she shut it down? I don't know. It's, um, that's, that's left, to, left to be determined. But that's a really good, it's a good question and something I, I, should, I should go dig into and see if we can find out. It's just so rare for us to, 
see anglerfish alive, yeah. that being able to, to understand any of these processes that we can't necessarily understand from anatomy alone is really difficult. It's a huge Definitely. challenge. Um, another fan fin question. Do you know what the purpose or value of the fan fin streamers are? Yeah, so um, we think that they, they both help, they could help to attract prey, just like the lure is doing. They also, though, are sort of like um, sensors in her environment to help her feel what's happening kind of around like, her. Like whiskers? Yeah, like whiskers. Mm -hmm, exactly. Cool. And so, um, again, I think those are the two leading, leading theories on, on what, their, what their, you know, their use and purpose are. Awesome. Um, he also commented, very cool. Yeah, go, go <laughs> look them up. Um, there's an, um, the, the YouTube video, go into your room, turn off the lights, make it quiet, put on some sort of like, I don't know, ethereal, I don't know, Pink Floyd or some funky music and just watch this video. If you look up Fanfin Anglerfish, you'll find it, Rebekah Foundation. It's mesmerizing because her ten the, those tendrils that they do, it's like little lights that they kind of start in by her head and then shoot out. Like you see it, um, it's like the things like you see at like amusement parks that kids mm -hmm. carry. Those, it's inc it's amazing, amazing. Yeah, I and then all of a sudden they zoom in and you can see the male and you're like, what? That's really cool. Uh, a yeah. message from Audrey who works here. Has there been research on salmon in the Southern hemisphere, like in Patagonia? indicating the same reproductive strategies seen in our Northern Hemisphere salmon? It's a really good question. Um, in terms of the sneaker males, I don't know. I don't know. We are seeing this, so a study just came out, I think it was like two weeks ago, um, about the temperature effects um, and and the, the, um, the susceptibility of, fish right at their peak spawning or mating time to warmer temperatures in general. So not just for salmon, but in both the Southern and Northern hemisphere, that impact is definitely happening. But I don't know, you know, all of the stuff that I, and again, this was, this is the thing I gotta, I gotta do volume two. Um, all of the salmon researchers and work that I did, um, researchers I spoke to and, and, and work that I looked at was all from the Northern Hemisphere. So I don't know if Southern Hemisphere salmon operate differently in terms of their mating. It's a great question. I'm like writing this all down. <laughs> Anglerfish, salmon. I'm sorry, I can't answer it. That's all. That's every, really every I don't know is just a scientist like job security, right? Yeah, there you go. Um, one more question. Are there other species that use sound to attract and communicate with meats? Um, yes. guessing that's in relation to the dolphin conversation that we had earlier. Yeah. Sound and community that, that you sound, was that the question? Yep. To attract and communicate with meats. Yes. So there are from fiddler crabs, which are the ones with the one giant claw where the males actually click mm -hmm. to cod and haddock, all of your ground fish that use that their, their swim bladders to create that drumming drums. Yep. Those all use sound. The males actually in, in cod and haddock, they form what, what are known as leks, um, which are basically groups of males that get together to strut in, and kind of um, show off in a big enough way that it actually serves to attract the females. So they sort of cooperate for a little bit before they compete in order to bring the females in and cod do this as well as um haddock with with sound um certainly the marine mammals use a lot of sound um as well but yeah we see it we see it across fish um yeah crustaceans it's a it's a very very common um way to communicate in the ocean because sound travels so much better than visuals right. um one of my favorite examples is um oh my gosh i'm gonna blink on the name it's a it's a fish that lives up in it it, it comes up into seattle it's really kind of ugly um shoot but it 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 creates this this vibration the males kind of go up into the shallows from the depths and then they'll hum to attract the females and the humming uh, midshipman fish 
It's a plain fin midshipman. And he, they, they go up into the shallows and <laughs> they're, they're, before they figured it out, I think it was like 2015 or 16, they were humming so loud. And this area was where there was a lot of boats. And I guess the whole of the boats was acting as like an echo chamber and it was projecting the sound that people thought, like people were calling the cops to say there was like noise disturbance in the neighborhood. <laughs> and this was like, you know, a problem. And they couldn't figure out what, you know, what it was. And so finally they realized that it was this, this male as, as they're making the call for the female. And what's fascinating is the female. So the female, as she starts to come into mating season, cause it's, it's a seasonal thing. Um, her body chemistry will change and she'll start to ovulate. The chemical transition that happens to cue ovulation also affects the nerves in her ears. And her ears are able to hear much more accurately the very specific frequency within which the males hum. So she journeys up and is able to hear them from farther away and hone in. After she lays her eggs, the chem, the, you know, her internal chemistry shifts through that process, her hormone levels change and her ears become deaf to it. So she doesn't have to <laughs> listen to it anymore. And then she swims back down to the depth. And I just like, that's brilliant. That's amazing. <laughs> Partnerships would love to be like, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's so, some married couples like, yeah. I mean, us. nature <laughs> figured it out. It's like ovulation and ears. Okay. Let's Let's make hearing and this, this makes sense. We're going to, we're going to work awesome. together. Yeah. So it's again, fascinating. And, and some of the, the, the science, you know, to, to figure this stuff out is, is difficult. And so luckily these species come up to the shallows. And so we, we just know so much more about species that we have that kind of access to than the ones that, that stay down deep for, for much, for the whole time. That's awesome. I yeah, did just find question. a video of that sound. I sent it to everybody. It's oh, cool. Good. It's such a crazy cool sound. It's like, but it's like a yeah. deep didgeridoo. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what it sounds like. So yeah. cool. Um, all right, everybody, awesome. thank you so much. The thanks are pouring in. Everybody had a great time. Everybody I'm loved so it. So Mara, thank well, you so much thank for you your all. time. And and please don't um please don't hesitate to reach out if there's any follow-up questions and, and hope Definitely. we can do more um, in person sometime soon. Wishing everybody really, Hopefully. really good help. If anybody doesn't have it yet, this <laughs> book is incredible. It's so fun. It's so well written. It's fascinating. You gotta get it. And then Dr. Hart here has agreed to sign and send you a copy. So one lucky winner that followed through with the whole, yeah, Jonah's showing off. I Yay! like it. <laughs> um, so one lucky winner that stuck with us, we will draw a name probably early next week. We'll post a video and then we'll contact whoever won. So we'll make sure we yes. get this to the right place. So you thank bet. you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's so good to see you. It's great to see you guys too. And um, really best, best wishes for good health and hope everyone gets, gets a chance to get back in the sea soon. Be well, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye.